Welcome to the Voice of Many podcast show with Yolanda and Vanessa. Good evening. This is our session session that we call Table Talk, where we get together with our um, guests after their recording, and we just have a a good old fashioned conversation time amongst friends. So um, this edition is with our special guest um, Buddy Rowe. Um, and this title is going to be Family. Um, if you missed his recording um, earlier, his interview, please, please go back and listen to it. Um, this is one artist, one producer that has so much history, so much um, love, compassion, that bats him and makes him the man that he is. With further ado, I welcome Buddy Rowe. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Hello. So we Hello. were talking about your your family. You, you, the floor mm-hmm. is all yours. If you want to start with your grandmother, with with your production family. Let's all yours. Um, yeah, so I know we was uh, kind of thinking a little bit about uh, family, and um, I was just just kind of reminiscing and just kind of thinking about uh, my uh, my grandma, uh, who was really like the uh, she's like the real backbone that kind of held our family together. And uh, even, you know, even with her passing, you know, you know, a few years ago, um, the family still has learned a lot and and instilled a lot of knowledge from her that we can kind of pass on to, you know, our generation. Um, You know, my grandma, she was a, she, she was, she was a a grandma of 12 kids along with uh, 10 adopted kids. So it was a total of 22 kids running around with it. And, you know, they, they've all had grandkids. So it was a very huge knit family growing up in the South. Um, for those who, who are not aware of growing up in the South, you know, our families are very close because of growing up. We still have to deal with, uh, you know, David Duke, uh, you know, president of the KKK in that area. So, Family was very big for us, you know, because we wanted to make sure our family was all together, everyone was safe. You know, we just created that that soulful vibe. Um, yeah, my grandma, she uh, she has a lot of history, um, you know, embedded in her. You know, of course, my grandpa, you know, being in the army, uh, he actually retired with the Purple Heart. Uh, so he was, like I said, a major part of the family. Um, but, you know, everyone just knew grandma, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, there was, there, there was so much, you know, that she, she, she done for us. Uh, one of the, I, I remember, uh, one of the things that stuck out the most is how much our grandma loved us. To where, you know, you get that grandma love where she gives you whatever you want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But on, but on the flip side of it, <laughs> well, flip side of it, don't play with me. Don't play with grandma. <laughs> <laughs> oh, grandma, the, did she I, didn't I, never I, run I, after you with the broom, did she? Oh, you don't. You don't even know that happened. <laughs> A broom, a broom to us was nothing but a little bit of old little, little branch off the. <laughs> little oh, she got a switch. So, 
my grandpa, my grandpa was the one that used the switch. You know, he was old school, so he had this tree that sat in front of the house. <laughs> and every time we get in trouble, he'll make us go pick the <laughs> pick the switches <laughs> off that tree. But he'll make us. He what he'll do is he'll make us get two switches and then he'll he'll twist them together. Mm-hmm. No, that's the worst. Yeah, and make you dip them in water and then get you. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, man. And they'd be some long, they'd be some long switches. So, you know, even if we run, he still catch them. <laughs> <laughs> be hearing it going through the wind as it's coming towards you. Yeah, <laughs> going past your ear. <laughs> <laughs> Some long, and you know we we were all fast, you know. So we, some long switches were none for him. He he can reach out and get it. But um, but but what makes what makes my grandpa uh like I said everything my grandpa was my my grandma was she was just a female version of it. Um, but of course you know with with men you know we're very disciplined and we show less emotion than what than what you know females do. Mm-hmm. But our discipline it has emotion built into it. It just perceives a different way. So we've always looked at our grandpa's like he's a, a no nonsense kind of guy. You know, don't you can't even joke with him or anything to that nature. Even though that's just how he perceives. So what made my grandma different from my grandpa is um, there were quite a few times, <laughs> and I do mean a few times. I know one instance where me, it was me and three of my cousins. Mm-hmm. So we all grew up around the same age, right? So, you know, we had our older cousins. They all hung out together. Then me and three of my cousins, uh, we were all the same age. So we always hung out together. Um, we were kind of considered the, the, the bad kids out of the, out of all the cousins. <laughs> Just because, you know, we're growing up behind our big cousins. And, you know, they always messing with us. So we always got to defend ourselves and, you know, we retaliate, things like that. But it was all family fun. But uh, there were quite a few times where uh, my grandma, she had, so we, there was a house called, so we had like three houses on this property. It was called the Red House. It was a red house, which was called the Brick House. And the Brick House is where, um, you know, my, my grandpa and my grandma stayed in. However, Mind you, there were 22 kids in the house, right? Mm-hmm. This brick house had like 14 rooms inside of it. Wow. wow. Mind you, me growing up as a little kid growing up, I always thought that there were uh, like six or seven rooms. Wow. I never oh. knew that there was 14 rooms until I got older. Hmm. That's amazing. So... There were times where, you know, you know, as kids, you kind of snoop around the house and, you know, you, you, you kind of find certain things. My yeah. grandma, and I, I kid you not, my grandma always had an elephant gun sitting you know, like right above <laughs> her, her door in her room. And we were always, as kids, you know, you all, you're so curious as far as, you know, wow, look at that gun, you know, can we? see it can't play with it you know but she had on a mantle right above the door so it was just one of those curious things you know whenever they leave to go to the store we'll take it down and play with it and whatnot and we'll come back we'll put it up well one one i don't know i don't know how we did this but one day we uh we were kind of like going through the house and we, we found a you know we found a gun in one of the rooms uh, mind you, they're not loaded or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, we were just kind of snooping through. And one of our parents had came home, or they came from the store, uh, and it was that's what we was doing. And we was like, you know, we, you know, we kind of going through the house, and we, was, and we found a gun in here. And, there was, you know, our, our parents told us, you know, put it back. That's your grandpa's gun. And we were like, well, you know, what's up with the elephant gun? And they was telling us a story about how he had it when he was in the war, you know, and, you know, they let him keep the, they let him keep the gun, you know, as a souvenir. Wow. Um, one of my other cousins who stayed in one of the houses next door, which is my, one of my grandma's, you know, daughters. Mm-hmm. So 
he was telling us, he was like, yo, hey, y'all come, come back here real quick. And he had found another room in the house. Again, another room we didn't know about. Uh, and he was telling me that, man, there's a lot of guns in his house. And we was like, what? <laughs> My grandma had 37 guns <gasps> hidden in the house. Really? Whoa. Wow. We was like, 37 guns? I'm talking about guns was inside of the grand piano. Like, you know, when you open up the grand piano, well, the kids. She was were ready. Was, yes. She was ready to go. So that's wow. why, I mean, that's, you know, kind of stems from her teaching us how to shoot guns. But the crazy story, though, is there was, uh, <laughs> there was, there was one day we were sitting on the porch. We was all talking. Um, I don't know what happened. My cousin must have said something inappropriate <laughs> mm. in front of my grandma inside the house. And all I know is we seen him just <laughs> dashing out the front seat. And all we heard was, if y'all don't want to die, y'all better get off my porch. And we were kind of like, <laughs> next thing you know, we heard the gun cock. And you know, we you know, we just took off and then when we finally looked back, you know, our grandma was on the porch with the shotgun. Uh, my cousin must have said something he wasn't supposed to say, he must have cussed or something. But yeah, but our grandma she was very loving but she was she was not the one to play with. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Oh my, that's great. That's great. You were um, saying earlier that your mom is now in the ministry. Uh, yeah, my mom. She's actually um, an uh, uh, excuse me, an ordained a missionary. Okay. So that's so she's uh, you know she <laughs> yeah she's uh, she's you know she's uh, you know heavily involved in church. Uh, which, you know, which is a blessing, um, you know, just to kind of keep, you know, to keep me and the family and everything balanced, you know. Um, I, I, I wholeheartedly believe in God, and you know, I'm very religious myself. Um, so I, I feel, you know, a good blessing for her to really go through that path and, you know, become a missionary, um, you know, in the church. Um, but, yeah, she's very, you know, very supportive of what I do. A lot. I get a lot of people. Um, who knows my mom mm-hmm. and then you know they kind of see what I do and it's kind of like well your mom's a missionary you know she's going to approve of what she do and you know my mom looks at me as a son first and foremost before anything so mm-hmm. you know, she she's one of my one of my biggest supporters you know even though something she may not approve of but you know the, what I like about my mom is she doesn't she doesn't put it in my face like, well, I don't like you doing this and that. Mm-hmm. Nah, whatever I do, she's just gonna support me. That's great. That's great. That's amazing. A lot of people right now don't have that support, no matter what it is, whether it's their mom or dad, or for you, like also your grandmother, not wanting to be supportive that you have a full family completely behind you who love you and care for you no matter what you decide to do. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, that, that's going to be, that's a lot of things that people miss out on, which is going to be very, very key. Like, if you don't want to get into, like, you know, this industry, because this industry can be a, a, a devil at times. And, you okay. know, without having the right support, I mean, you can get swallowed up. I've heard a lot of people say that. So I know you have the support of your um, family, but what about your production family? Um, I have a lot of support uh, when it comes to this. Uh, one thing that people, and I'm just speaking to those who are listening, so one thing that you want to understand, anyone who wants to get into the same kind of business, keep in mind there's going to be you you have to really understand who's gonna who's who and who's gonna be in your mm-hmm. corner. Um, because it is a very cutthroat business. There's a lot of people that's gonna be there from set for themselves, and they just wanna use you to kind of benefit themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So, regardless of how you look at it, there's always going to be this bridge and a gap when it comes to your family in this in this in this uh, you know entertainment field. Because it's always it's always fun when you start off with your best friends or your friends or those you know you you, you create this dream and you want to do this. So mm-hmm. it always starts off with a group of people. Now, based off of how hard you work, not everyone can make it, and it's just and it's it's not a rule. It's just one of those things of nature where out of thirty of y'all, out of twenty of y'all, only one person, one or two people, is going to make it. Mm-hmm. But it's in our nature to say, "Hey, I'm about to make it, or I'm doing good," and you want to bring those friends along with you. So if they're not working as hard as you are, or they're just alone for the ride, that's when you start noticing the separation between you and those you're trying to bring along or those who are trying to cling on to what you're doing. By the time you look up, that gap where you and your friends were so close is now separated where it's a huge gap because you're up here because of all the work that you're putting in, because of what the what the, the entertainment is wanting you to do that they can't do. But now there's this huge gap of separation. So now there's this thing where you have to bridge that gap. How do you make that gap close? Well, you certainly don't want to take yourself and bring yourself down to their level. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty much where they're going to have to elevate themselves to where you're at. And a lot of people don't have the strength or the, or the, the mindset to really be a part of this. So that's where, as far as, you know, the support in this business, you got to really know who's going to be there to support you. If, if they're working just as hard as you're working, if they have the same mindset, the same vision, the same goals, um, if, if someone doesn't have those things for you, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to really, um, you know, bring them along or be a part of what, what you're trying to do. I remember when I started this music thing, like I said, it was, it, it started off as, it started off as me and my boy, Larry, um, who I first met here. And then from that point, it grew to like, I had like 30 people around me where, you know, I'm I'm doing I'm doing beats for everybody. You know, I'm the only mm-hmm. one with the recording studio, so everyone's coming to my studio, and I'm trying to record everybody, get all these songs done, mix and master. So it was a lot of work on me to get everything done. And I realized that yo, I'm not really feeding myself. I'm just really taking care of everybody because mm-hmm. I wasn't charging nobody for you know oh. studio time or nothing. Mm-hmm. And this is you know this is eating up my bills and and. And, you know, taken away from my family because I'm constantly doing this for them. Mm -hmm. But then I noticed when I told myself that, yo, I'm really the backbone of this. If I was to fall out, they would have nothing to do. Because I'm the foundation of this. So when I said that, you know what, I really need to start focusing on me to make sure that I'm okay Mm -hmm. because all this would be for nothing if they decide to leave me. So when I started working on myself, that's when I started seeing the true colors of, okay, was you really here to support everything we're doing or were you really just here for you? Mm. So the true true colors started coming out um, and that's when I just started seeing people drop off. Mm. Drop off, drop off, drop off. And that group of 30 doing it down to a group of 15. Wow. And it went from 15 wow. to 8. And it went from 8 to 4. And so, you really don't have a lot of support when it comes to this. But there are those, you know, that do, you know, you know, it's almost like the changing of the guards. You know, those who you came up with won't be there when you're successful. And you garnish new successful people. So, um, I have I have a nice group of uh, people that that fully support and you know you know we just we just making it happen as it is. It's crazy that I talk about this because I would say out of all the thirty people that was around, 
I would say that it's only about three, maybe four, that are still around, you know, making this thing happen. Everybody else is brand new. Wow. Wow. Wow, that's something. That's better. Feel kind of strange, but then too, some as the saying goes, some people are in your life for a year, or a season, or even a month. But very true. Mm. Now, don't get me wrong; like we're still like those people. We're, we're still cool. I mean, we you know we we're still cool. It's just that you know, just not to create mixed feelings, you know, and you know how it is like when you, let's say if you, uh, like, like if you was in a relationship, you know, and the, and the relationship was good and you guys broke it off, mm-hmm. but y'all was on good terms, it just makes that friendship a little bit, it just makes it feel different. It's not like you can be like, hey, mm-hmm. you know, what's up, how you doing anymore? It's kind of like you have to be very mindful of what you see and how you move around, mm-hmm. them, you know. Yeah, never the same. So, yeah, so we're still, we're all still cool. You know, I just learned that I got to kind of distance myself at times, you know, because you don't want that, you don't want that, that old tie to kind of surface back up. That's mm-hmm. true. It's true. Do you ever find it being, um, Kind of depressing at times, or I guess isolating. Uh, yeah, it's 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 definitely there's times where you you feel like like damn this is not it. Like sometimes you do feel like you're alone, and and things are just not going your way. And then you look up and you see other people with all the support, you know, supporting them. You know, sometimes those kind of thought processes. They they trigger. They're hard to kind of like. They're hard to to get over at times because it does kind of blind you from the fact that you do have support. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's just not as you as you as as you're used to, mm-hmm. but the support is there. Um, but there, there are times where it's like it's hard to really do it on your own or with the little support you have. But one thing that I have learned is you don't need 30 people, you know, to to build your brain or do what you got to do. But sometimes the strength is in small numbers. Yeah, that's, that's true. true. That's very true. Very true. But that also is. means you get to know the people around you a lot better. Oh, yeah. And, that, and that's, one of the, that's one of the things... You know, with with having so many people around you, I never really got a chance to really know everybody on a personal level mm. like that. So there was only a few people that I can really that I can really say I know him, know him. Others, it's like, you know, I know of him because of him, and so that kind of makes it difficult. So yeah, with having very few people around, you're able to to know and understand that person. So it it, it makes whatever you do that much easier. Well, but I tell you, it's you're easy guy to talk to. Easy, easy guy to talk to. And I'll tell anyone out there that um, get to know a person. Get to know a person. Take that time to sit down and and don't always judge that book by the cover. Turn the pages and see what's on the inside. Um, you're a good soul. Man. Definitely a good soul. So. No, I think that's been like um, I think that's been like one of the Achilles heel of of me doing this. When people like, if you guys will probably see me in, in you know real life, <laughs> not saying that you saying that <laughs> that you would do this, but when people see me, and and I'm not for sure if it's maybe the success or just how I my my facial expression. But people are like, man, you're always mad. Oh no! And I'm like, what? No, I'm just, I'm the coolest person. You know, I, I, goof, I like to have fun. I goof myself. But people be intimidated to speak to me. 
because they think that I'm always like mad or upset by my facial expression. Mm-hmm. Um, they'd be like, you don't ever smile pictures. I'd be like, uh, <laughs> I, I take a lot of photos and they don't, they tell me not to smile. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, yeah, like when you're doing, like, marketing ads and campaigns. Okay, and yeah. 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 And so, and so when I take pictures, I'm just so used to it, um, you know, and they'll be like, you don't ever smile. I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the funnest guy you can be around, the coolest laid-back person you can be around. But then also, like, with the success of, you know, me doing music and whatnot, there's a lot of artists, you know, they are, like, they get intimidated to work with me because they're like, man, I can't, you know, I can't keep up with, with the status of Buddy Rowe, man. I'm, I'm afraid that I'm not going to do as well on the song. I'm like, bro, listen, I'm just as human as you. But like, man, look, let's just do music. I don't care about the status and all that. Like, you want to do music? Let's do music. Yeah. Nah, man, I don't think I'm ready to get on the song with you. I'm not there yet. <laughs> I say, what? <laughs> Like, man, it's just music, but I just, I, I just enjoy doing music. Nah, man, you like a legend out here. Man. I, I got to get my, I got to get my, I got to get my bars up. <laughs> All right, well, you know. <laughs> so, like, a lot, a lot of people, I had a hard time really doing music with a lot of people. I think because of my work ethic. Like, I'm, I was like, like, I guess, like, when I do a project with somebody else, or, so matter of fact, a lot of people have told me this, like when they ask me to get on a song with them, it takes, it takes, I would say it takes about a whole week for them to understand that you don't got to impress me. You ain't got to give me this speech. Because people are giving me this speech like, yo, man, I've been listening to you since, you know, I was a little kid and this and that. And man, I grew up listening to your music. Uh, man, bro, you, you got the city on lockdown. And, and man, you just, you know, you're doing big things and you're in a whole nother lane, man. I just want to get on a song with you. And I'm like, bro, you ain't got to give me this, this speech. Just, Hey, if you want to do music, let's just do it. Let's lock in and do some music. That's true. I'm just saying though, man, like, you know, this, I'm like, bro, we're we going to do it or not, you know? <laughs> but then when we, when we do projects, uh, I'm the type of person where I'm, I'm so passionate about it that it's like I take over the project. Mm. And I and I think that's the kind of the the passion that I have and the work ethic that I have was like if my name is on anything, like this got to be it got to be right, yeah. mm-hmm. you know. And so people would come into this whole idea of doing music with me was like, yo, let's get on the mixtape, or yo, let's do a song. And I'm like, okay, what's your plan of action? What are we gonna do with this? And it's like, well, you know, I just want I just want to get on a song with you. I said. Okay, and what is it for? You know, how are we going to benefit? What are we, what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do once it gets done? So, um, I, I pretty much take over people's projects, which they don't mind because I guess they understand my work ethic. So, I think that's why a lot of people get kind of intimidated to really work with me. I tell you, they tell you that. They can learn a lot from you. They definitely can learn mm-hmm. a lot. I mean, it's just. I mean, you should see too that you're a person just like everybody else. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I tell you, it's it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having this table talk session with us. Um, please I, stay in contact. Well, I definitely do that. Oh, one other thing I did, I know we spoke about the movie Plug Love. Mm-hmm. Um, if if y'all have not seen the movie Plug Love, it's like one of the the biggest um, independent films uh, that's ever been produced by, you know, um, a, a, a black uh, production team. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people love that movie. Yeah. One thing I want to say about that movie is my, one of my homeboys, matter of fact, it's, uh, and I know you heard me say this name a lot, Devon Bray. Mm-hmm. His son, which does music as well, his son is actually 
on one of the soundtracks of the movie. I wish I can give you the time frame of when it plays in the movie, but he's actually one of the soundtracks on that movie. Okay. Um, they've been they've been talking to the producer of the uh, of the movie Plug Love, and they kind of gave us a lot of insights in regards to the movie world. Uh, so it's, it's it's been a it's been a lot of blessings that you know we've been kind of going through as far as building this brand and this platform that we got going on. Um, it's, it's great. Yeah, I, yeah, I was, I was kind of, I, I hit up the homie. I was like, "Yo, um, I was like, I didn't know. Uh, I was like, yo, I didn't know that. Uh, you know, he was on the soundtrack. And he was like, yeah, I, you know, he he was talking to the producer and he submitted, you know, the music to him and they they picked it up. That's, that's great. That's great. It's incredible. The movie is really well done and I would recommend it to anyone it's really really good I I recommend just keeping up with with Buddy Rowe period Um, NFK original is the movie um, section of it but I'm, I'm just telling you guys please follow this man follow his work um, has much to be desired, and and I have to say, it is all good. It's all good. I appreciate you guys for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's it's been a blessing. It's definitely been a blessing. Right. Want to take us on out? Yeah. Yes. Thank you once again, Buddy Row, and thank you to our listeners for listening to the Voice of Many podcast. If you have any questions or suggestions, please contact us on our many social media web pages. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, and we hope to talk to you later.